we're going to read chapter 20 called Battery of Our Bear Walker Book. I look back at the bear. I know that staring into the eyes of a wild animal isn't a good idea. That animal might take it as a challenge, but I can't seem to make myself look away. Ever since I can remember, I've wanted to see a bear in the wild. I know how risky it might be to get this close to a bear, so close it could be on top of me in only a few steps. But compared, compared to the humans not far from here who would gladly kill me, this bear seems positively benevolent. I don't feel threatened. But then again, maybe I should. Because of the way the bear is sitting, like a person might sit leaning back against a birch tree with her hind legs thrust out in front of her and her front paws held up to her chest, I can see she is a female bear. She's so close I can see not only the dugs of her belly where her little ones would nurse, but also that thin hairline, that thin hair around seems wet. Maybe I could talk to her in a low reassuring voice Tell her I mean no harm. Greet her as a relative because I belong to the bear clan. Something growls near me. Then I feel a tug on the toe of my right boot. I don't move my head, but I look down with my eyes and see what I thought I would. I am in deep doo-doo, I think. There, chewing on the toe of my shoe, is a baby bear. A chirping sound comes from behind me and something nudges my back. I don't have to look this time to know that it's the first little bear's brother or sister. I'd better not look back. Moving right now is the worst thing I can do. I'm in the most dangerous place a human being can be in the wild, directly between a mother bear and her cubs. These are not tiny bears. After all, they were born last February as hairless, blind little creatures during their mother's hibernation. They've had a whole spring and summer of being fed and protected by their mother, demanding little brats that have run a ragged as they get into everything in sight. Sorry about that. Now, in October, they are probably weigh about 60 pounds each, and they're strong little buggers. Just as I think that, the bear climbs behind me, thrusts both of his front feet hard against my back, at the same time as the first cub yanks hard on my boot. I go sprawling down the slope. As I roll, closing my eyes and covering my face with my hands, a thought goes through my mind. Be careful not to wish too hard for anything, otherwise you might get it. I hadn't understood what Grandma Katuri meant when she said that to me one day. Now I do. I wanted to see bears, but not like this. Not seeing them might be the last thing I'll ever see. <clears throat> my rolling is stopped, but not gently, by the trunk of a hemlock as my back, torn and bruised by the rock salt, hits hard against it. It hurts so much that I have to bite my lip to keep from shouting. My eyes are still closed. If I don't open them, maybe the mother bear won't see me. That's what I'm thinking. Smart, eh? But at least it's no longer between the, I'm no longer between the mother and her babies, so I have to be safer, right? Wrong. This game is too interesting for them to quit now. I hear the thumping of their feet just before they land on top of me. They're chuckling and woofing and chirping, almost singing as they maul me, batting me, batting at me with their paws, pulling at my shirt and my baggy pants with their teeth. I'm being bruised, but they're not trying to hurt me. They aren't biting hard enough to draw blood or, and although their claws are scratching me, it's in fun. I keep pushing them away from my face to keep them their sharp little teeth away from my nose and cheeks, which seems particularly attractive to them. I can smell their sweet milk breath, which is almost like that of a nursing puppy. I keep my hands open, pushing, not grabbing. I try to sit up against their playful onslaught. They are so comical that even though I'm getting bounced around like a rag doll, I have to laugh out loud. I can't help it. Woof! The sound between a cough and a roar is so loud that it stuns me. But it has the exact opposite effect on the two cubs. They know the sound of their mother bear warning her cubs to seek shelter. The two of them yelp and claw their way up the trunk to the nearest tree. Naturally, it's the hemlock I'm propped up against. And once again, I'm between them and their mother with the mo one significant difference. Rather than being 20 feet away, the large, very imposing mother bear is now standing right over me. I should have used my tree climbing skills and scuttled up after them, but 
it's too late now. <sighs> Sound she makes isn't a growl. Even though her paws are on either side of me, I can feel the heat of her body. I'm not afraid anymore. My relative, I say to her in Mohawk, take pity on me. Almost in slow motion, she opens her mouth and bites me on the shoulder. Her sharp teeth tear through the cloth of both shirts and into the flesh of my shoulder. It hurts, but I don't cry out. She lifts me up, shakes me once, not as hard as she might, and tosses me off to the side, away from the tree where her cubs have sought refuge. But she doesn't do what a bear should do then. She doesn't follow up with a mauling attack. She just stands there, swaying her head from side to side. Hmm, mm, she says. I stand up slowly, moving backwards as best I can up the slope. Maybe I should repeat that sound, move my head back and forth the way she's doing. It's what Mr. Fadden told me to do when a bear greets you, but if I tried it right now, I'd probably fall and roll back down the slope. My legs are shaky, and I'm feeling as if I don't know whether to laugh or cry. For some reason, there are tears in my eyes. I'm a victim of assault and battery at the paws and claws of the teeth of three bears. But I feel on the one hand, that is, if I've been blessed, and on the other, as if I should turn, go back down the slope and wander off into the forest with them like a little orphan boy in the old Mohawk, Mohawk story. I keep moving. The mother bear stays there watching me as I climb farther up the trail. Her two cubs scoot down from the tree to stand next to her. One of them takes a step as if it, to go up the trail after me and she quickly cuffs him back behind her. Finally, I come to a place where the way is so steep that I have to grasp a tree branch and pull myself up. I have to turn my gaze away from them only for a second, but when I look back, the bears are gone. It's so sudden that I wonder for a moment if I've imagined it all. Then I begin to feel the throb in my left shoulder. It's beginning to ache with a puncture wound made from the mother bear's canine teeth. My clothing is torn. My hands and arms are bleeding from a dozen scratches. Yet beaten up as I might be, I feel as if I've been given a gift at the start of this strange day. I turn and keep climbing toward the place where the light coming from the east is making the exposed rock slope glow as gold as the sun. I'm still following the silver trail markers. The bare seat isn't far from here. There's a branch in the trail I have to find to get to it. Then a thought comes to me. The phone. Did I lose it when I had my encounter with the bears? I slap my hand against my pocket in a moment of panic. It's still there. I flick it open and, pr and press a key. Beep. And a light comes on. Great. A series of musical notes plays a pattern of circle forms expanding in waves. Then the digital display appears and my heart sinks. Low battery, it reads.